This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. It was 1846, and Robert Schumann felt that his life was falling apart. Mental illness had run in his family, and succumbing himself was his worst fear. In August 1844, he had hit bottom. His wife Clara wrote, Robert could not sleep a single night. His imagination painted him the most fearful pictures. Early in the morning, I usually found him bathed in tears. He quite gave himself up, end quote. Schumann's phobias and mood swings began to rule his life. But he never stopped composing. He had already written hundreds of songs and piano compositions by the time he wrote his first symphony, which was also his first orchestral piece in 1841. It was followed quickly by his second symphony, which he revised and later published as Symphony No. 4, his overture scherzo and finale, a year of chamber music, and a secular oratorio, Paradise and the Peri. So he was thoroughly experienced, not just as a composer, but as an orchestral composer. And it was his knowledge of what he could do with his compositions to confront his demons that may have kept him going for the 10 more years he had to live. While a case of syphilis may eventually have compounded his problems, Schumann's mental disorders had long defined him. One way he learned to deal with them was to give voice to the two sides of his personality in his essays and criticism, which took the form of dialogues between Florestan, the passionate, volatile side, and Eusebius, the dreamy one. Florestan and Eusebius also showed up in many of his longer piano works, and in many ways he was beginning to rely on them to help him work out his problems on paper. But he had not yet found the right way to let them speak through the orchestra. In the summer of 1845, after a year in which he struggled to write anything at all, Schumann wrote to Felix Mendelssohn, Drums and trumpets in C have been blaring in my head. I have no idea what will come of it. End quote. What would eventually come of it was the fanfare that opens his Symphony No. 2 and then hovers like a ghost over the rest of the piece. Getting those notes on paper, though, was not all that easy at first. Writing again to Mendelssohn in September 1845, Schumann reported, All writing is a severe strain on me. I itch and twitch every day in a hundred different places. A mysterious complaint. Whenever the doctor tries to put his finger on the thing, it seems to take wings. But better times will come again, and to look at my wife and children is joy enough. End quote. Suddenly, in the second week of December, Schumann's creative juices started to flow, and in the space of about three weeks, he composed the essentials of the symphony. His troubles were not over, though. As he worked on the orchestration, he began to experience a continual ringing and roaring in his ears, so debilitating that he was forced to take a break from work. Schumann worried that audiences would notice traces of what he called the black period in which he wrote this symphony. And there are, in fact, many echoes of the ghosts that haunted him, but in the end, this is a symphony about hard-won affirmation and triumph. Schumann had begun his first symphony with a flourish in the brass, but that one was a true fanfare, an announcement worthy of a great composer's first orchestral piece. In the second symphony, the brass offer a ghostly echo of the first symphony's opening, as if heard from a distance. It is a signature we will hear again. But this fanfare does not exist on its own. Schumann was fond of presenting distinct themes and then weaving them together, and at the opening of this symphony, the brass fanfare is surrounded by a related melody in the low strings, which winds around it, muddying the harmonic waters. 
It turns out that this is not a typical slow introduction in the manner of Haydn or Mozart, but rather a fully integrated chapter in the work. It doesn't just break into a quick allegro, but instead increases its energy gradually. The oboe and the other woodwinds announce a new motif, which picks up the pace even more until it reaches the principal tempo, allegro ma non troppo, or fast, but not too fast. The main theme, derived from that woodwind motif, is jumpy and forceful. The development section is a series of motifs that shift restlessly, as if searching for solid footing. Nothing here seems settled until the recapitulation. And the opening fanfare makes a ghostly return in the coda. The second movement scherzo is a showcase for the strings. Especially for the first violins, who play a perpetual motion figure that is a challenge to even the best orchestral players. The hustle and bustle lets up for the movement's two contrasting trios. The first one, with a crisp, sparkling melody from the woodwinds and a more lyrical response from the strings. Toward the end, Schumann's attention seems to wander into one of his signature daydreams. But the sizzling scherzo returns in full force. The second trio is a tribute to Johann Sebastian Bach. The scherzo music returns, and towards the end of the movement, the brass fanfare from the symphony's opening makes a reappearance. Just as Schumann's mind swung between two extremes, he was drawn to extremes in his music. The perpetual motion scherzo is followed by an adagio that is extremely expressive, full of intimacy and yearning. It's full of sighs of melancholy, and the restless syncopated figures in the accompaniment only reinforce the mood. Schumann's orchestration is simple and tightly controlled, mirroring his attempts to control his own emotions. There is a big string melody, and midway through the movement, another tribute to Bach, a fugue. The fugue unrolls slowly but crisply, and rather than allow it to develop in the full Bach style, Schumann folds it into the movement's principal melody. and moves to the end with another appearance of the big string tune. Schumann goes to extremes again to begin the finale. It's solid and unquestionably triumphant, but he immediately drops into a minor key interlude.
This interlude is full of echoes of the previous movements, including the opening trumpet fanfare. There is a grand pause, and then, if you know your Beethoven, you'll recognize this melody in the solo oboe. It's a reference to Beethoven's song cycle on Die Ferne Geliebte, to the distant beloved, specifically the song Nimm sie in den diese Lieder, Take them then, these songs. It's a phrase Schumann used in a number of compositions. As the movement proceeds down the home stretch to the triumphant close, that oboe melody takes on overtones that seem to have Beethoven's ninth in their family tree. All of these Beethoven quotes show clearly just how serious Schumann was about continuing and expanding on the symphonic tradition begun by Mozart and Haydn and revolutionized by Beethoven. It's a legacy that he and his wife Clara took great pains to pass along to their young protege, Johannes Brahms. Over the course of the next hundred years, Schumann somehow acquired a reputation for clumsy orchestration. His shortcomings as a conductor only intensified his insecurity about his ability to orchestrate effectively. But he was also a quick study, and he had a remarkable ability to transfer the sounds he heard in his head into a new and distinctive orchestral sonority. In this arena, as in every other, Schumann was an original. In fact, he knew exactly what he was doing, and it has taken the better part of 150 years for the rest of the music world to catch on. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.